So, mate, firstly, thanks for inviting me to your makeshift home, I guess. Yeah, yeah, um, it's all right, no, comfortable. It's very comfortable, and it's warm, living under the ground in the bunker. Yep, you know, keeps you out of the elements in that, mate. Well, are so. we 10 feet deep? Uh, about that, yeah. They uh, This is one of the nicer built ones. Um, obviously, it depends on what facilities you have access to, so they've, they've obviously made planks to, to stop the ground caving in. Um, and, uh, you know, like strip the bark and stuff, which just keeps them tidy and everything. But, uh, yeah, this is one of the better built ones. It's take a while to build. Yeah, mate, it's comfortable sleeping on the top bunk last night. I don't think it was too warm. Yeah, <laughs> if you have the heater on, it's, uh, it's a bit of a nightmare. Obviously, you've got this thing, which is called a bujuka. And uh, what that does is just, just a, just a uh, wood stove, basically. Yeah. So, it, you know, keeps you warm at night. And how effective is something like this against, like, artillery? Uh, really pretty effective. If you if you're going to take a direct hit, um, obviously it, it, again I'm I'm not an engineer, so I won't yeah. be able to tell you the exact uh, dimensions of everything. But direct hit, you're going to suffer a bit. Um, but in regards to everything else, sort of around the bunker, you you're good. You're not going to take any shrapnel or anything. Obviously, uh, you're yeah. underground. Um, back in sort of 29, uh, 29, 19, 20, 21 years when I was on the in the front line in the east. Um, didn't really get too much artillery, uh, but mortars, uh, SPG, rec recallless rifles, that would hit the bunkers. And yeah, uh, yeah it wouldn't see much of a drama. It would shake, you might have to do some repairs, rebar the wood, that sort of thing. But other than that, it was pretty decent, mate. You've been here well before well, this phase of the war started. Mm, what we call the full-scale war. The full-scale war. Yeah. So can you talk us through, I guess, your history in the military uh, and then what drove you to come over to Ukraine many years ago? Yeah. Um, and who you are, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. So uh, I joined the British Army in around 2011. Um, spent uh, just under four years in the British Army. Um I uh, just just standard infantry, you know, nothing special. Um, I didn't do uh, didn't deploy to any combat zones. Uh, I studied languages uh, in the infantry, so I, I speak some Arabic, uh, Pashtun, that sort of thing. And then uh, yeah, basically, obviously, ISIS uh, started to emerge as a, as, a, as a caliphate, as a large organization. So um, around 2014, it started coming into my head, and I think early 2015, I decided to go out to Syria, um, and then I uh, spent a while in Syria out there. Uh, right at the beginning of the, the sort of ISIS takeover when they were swarming northern Iraq and uh, northeastern Syria. Um, and then after that, I, you know, uh, continued to do this. I worked as a medical volunteer in Burma uh, in 2016, uh, up in the northern areas of Burma, um, uh, with some of the, uh, uh, the sort of... Uh, what you can loosely call concentration camps, open air concentration camps, and trying to get aid into there and provide basic support, but uh, it wasn't the most effective mission. It's a very difficult country to operate in. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, I, I finished that. Um, I then went to work in Colombia for a while, lived in the States for a while, went to work in Colombia, um, where I was teaching English and uh, helping some basic training of like national police up in the, the, the southern, southern areas near Ecuador. Uh, after that, I decided to go back to Syria in 2017, 2018. Um, I went at the back end of the Raqqa operation as the, the ISIS caliphate was sort of uh, falling in on itself um, as we captured Raqqa. Uh, and then I uh, volunteered to head over to Afrin um, as the Turkish uh, state was using uh, free Syrian army members, uh, basically former ISIS guys re-flagged, re repurposed to uh, attack the Afrin canton. Um, I volunteered to work in the hospital there. Um, and uh, I was there for the entire operation until about the day before the Turks uh, or the Turkish backed Free Syrian Army captured the, uh, the city. Um, and then I ran an aid station outside Aleppo, a couple of kilometers outside Aleppo for another few months, um, treating casualties, uh, processing injured people, processing dead. Um, it was a pretty hard time. So once I got back from there, I uh, spent about, uh, about half a year or so, more than that, traveling around, moving around. Uh, spending time with family, um, and then I decided to come out to Ukraine, um, just uh, just under four years ago now. Um, so what year was that? Twenty seventeen? Uh, no, twenty early twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I came out here, um, and obviously, you know, uh, people's opinions say so, you know some people are war junkies and and all that sort of thing. I'm I'm not. Uh, still very scared on the front line. I don't go looking for a fight. I've had enough in my life. I'm I'm not really interested in doing that. I just 
I, I, I have a, a big passion about um, austere medicine um, and trauma care and stuff like that. So um, obviously uh, uh, the layman, a smart man, would go to university, study, become a nurse or a doctor, which to me I considered, but uh, maybe I just don't have the patience for it anymore. So decided to come out here to, to work as a combat medic in the military. Um, again, just, uh, you know, uh, best thing to do for me was, you know, stay in the military life. So it's always, always been well for me, fared well for me. So uh came out here joined the ukrainian marines alongside a few other british uh british volunteers who are unfortunately now captured they were captured in mariupol and, and is we... this sorry to interrupt but is that yep. mr aslan and mr pinner yep that's uh aiden aslan and sean pinner um yep. we served together for three years in the marines um spent about just under two years in total on the front lines um just outside mariupol um defending the area around there from obviously the separatists and unofficially the russians mm -hmm. um uh up until this happened so so basically for two years we lived like this so we we spent the whole time on the first line um so basically you know anything in front of us was the enemy um people think that you know the last eight years nothing happened um and that it was a very stable trench war you know making tea in the morning and waving at people across the trench but it it wasn't that um it wasn't interesting enough for the for the news to report it. It was a very long front line. Some areas were quiet, some areas were hot spots. So especially around my area, Mariupol, Shirokana, Pavlopol, um, it was a very big hot spot. Uh, my first tour in 2019, we lost uh, seven guys killed, um, four at once from a, from a mine that was put in our trench, um, and then two from a, a sniper using a thermal scope, uh, and another one, I, I think it was from a drone, and that was just from my company, uh, actually my platoon. Um, that we lost those guys from so uh second tour again uh that it was it was a lot of talk about mince agreements ceasefires uh demilitarization um, but we still lost guys we lost i think two three guys that tour and had some injured um it was still very kinetic just not in the sense it is now there wasn't big attacks and big pushes um just sort of skirmishes and a lot of fire superiority fighting so at night you would just fire fire at each other's positions to gain fire superiority uh, and that would be it and a lot of digging, a lot of digging, a lot of, digging. A lot of weight loss. Obviously, it's a, uh, it's a full-scale war now, so I had to move around the country a bit more. I don't have to spend two years in a trench, so I get to put a bit of timber back on and eat like a king for a bit. Um, but yeah, so yeah, anyway, so we, we got to that point, uh, and then obviously February 24th. So yeah. uh, I was actually on vacation, my R&R &R vacation for my last tour. I flew back to Ukraine on the 23rd. Um, and I've lived in Butcher for the last four years of my family. Um, so yeah, four years I've lived in Butcher. Uh, Butcher is, is a beautiful place. It was like the up and coming suburb of Kiev, West Kiev, you know, nice place to live. We, we had a relatively new apartment, um, which my, my missus owns, not me. I earned for about $400 a month for the Ukrainian army. So yeah, people can call me a mercenary, but if I was a mercenary, I'd be the worst, most Better underpaid mercenary it. ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the pay was terrible, but uh but yeah so yeah uh the war started um i remember waking up uh it was yeah february 24th um well, really backstory what me you know me Aiden and sean talking about it and others nobody believed it would happen um we were pretty much 100 percent because we were actually on the front line the year before when they'd done the mobilization when they'd done the build-up on the borders yeah. we were in the positions waiting to defend it and thankfully nothing happened um and then we assumed okay this is probably the real one now they're going to attack the east they're going to move the borders of the separatist regions to where they want them and and that'd be it we didn't expect like a full-scale invasion uh so i'd literally just come back to ukraine got back home to butcher uh me and mrs watch a movie or something gone to sleep and then uh uh yeah we got a call about 6 a.m from her dad woke us up uh, she didn't want to answer it she was just like oh it's probably nothing you know and i, I thought you know it's obviously an emergency he's calling at 6 a.m you should probably answer the phone uh, so she did answer the phone and I couldn't really hear what I, sp I speak Russian and Ukrainian, but I couldn't really hear what he was saying, but I watched her face and um, obviously knew something, you know, knew something was up, seen that look a few times. It's not my first invasion. Um, and yeah, got on live UA maps and I think literally as I was opening live UA maps, heard the first missiles coming in, um, the big calibers. So, you know, when they're, they're coming in and then, uh, yeah, it was like, uh, here we go. Um, I can't that was probably around zero five hundred or something in the morning uh you know sort of getting stuff ready I've, I've got seven cats and well now i have two dogs but i have seven cats two dogs um that i rescued from my positions on the front line from these sort of trenches a lot of cats living with you mm. they eat them rats and stuff so i've got a lot of fucking cats um so we just started getting everything ready um 
and no plans to really evacuate. Um, uh, probably in hindsight, it was maybe a mistake, but uh, you know, I, I consider myself to be experienced enough to have a good judgment, so I don't look back on the decisions and think oh, I made a bad decision. Um, yeah, went outside, and I live quite relatively close to Hostomel Airport, so I watched the 40 odd helicopters flying over. Um, when the Russians done the air assault on the airfield, uh, that was mental. And you, you sort of like this, you're like, I've lived there four years, a nice place, nicer than anywhere in London. It's nicer mm -hmm. than most places in the UK. And all of a sudden you, you've got Russian helicopters flying over your house. So they, they were just falling out of the sky. They lost a few of them flying in. Um, the whole skyline was on fire, you know, smoke billowing everywhere, black plumes of smoke. And I remember two Russian Su-25s flew over really low. Um, I've got got those. All, all this I captured on video actually, which is you know quite interesting for people to see. So yeah. that's, that's on my Instagram. I captured all that outside my house. Uh, about two minutes later, two Ukrainian Mi-8 helicopters flew over. Um, I've got the the actual cockpit video from that as well. They went and bombed the airfield as the paratroopers were landing. Uh, and that was it really. The rest was sort of a blur. Uh, first few days we didn't live in the basement because obviously the Russians were advancing down. Um, we'd spend some nights in the basement, some up in the house. And then I think the, you know, it was just a lot of nights sitting by the laptop, spamming F5, which I think a lot of people were doing on live UA. Um, and I was getting very frustrated because it kept crashing because so many people were overloading the website. And I was thinking, you fucking people sat at home in America, get off this website. I'm using it to track, you know, I'm watching the Russians come to my house, basically. Yeah. Using it to track the situation, understand how I've done, because live UA maps are incredible. Uh, incredible source of information. I've used it in many, many places. Uh, anyway, yeah, so uh, Russians started, you know, coming down and it, it was getting closer and closer and more intense. Um, I think about by the fourth or fifth day, we decided to full-time live in the basement. Um, very cramped, very small. Uh, this back in February, so it was fucking freezing. <laughs> yeah. So down the basement, it was cold, no heating. Um, luckily, I got seven cats to keep me warm, so that helped. Um, and then about the fourth or the fifth day, they, a Russian jet just in the middle of the night woke up, bearing in mind we're in the basement, we woke up to the building shaking from the jet flying in, uh, dropped some, uh, like I, I guess it was some bomb, not a rocket really, um, on an apartment about 200 meters from mine, um, blew open all the doors in the basement, blew open all my windows, all my like fire doors and everything. Um, and, and obviously I'm biased, so I don't like talking about, you know, what, you know what things are the ukrainians didn't do this the russians are bad ukrainians are perfect but i i know for a fact like there was no military in my i live in like the newer part of butcher like didn't see any ukrainian military saw a couple of territorial defense guys right at the beginning that came to hand out organized supplies and that was it the military were focused in other places or yeah. around the city and they just hit an empty apartment building luckily it was empty it was a new build apartment building um but badly damaged my apartment uh and then yeah i think i think the Basically, I'm a, I'm a medic by like trade or profession, whatever you want to call it. I, I've done a lot of medical courses and I'm also, I spent four months uh, on the Ukrainian medical course um, while I was in the Ukrainian military. So I basically, uh, I, I was, I made the decision myself because of my family uh, and I was told by my commander who was in Mariupol at the time, there was no way for me to get from Butcher to Mariupol. I'd have to go via Mikolaev and then maybe get on a vehicle sent there. Yeah. Um, so I made a decision, obviously, get my family out. You know, one more rifle isn't going to make a difference. Um, so I stuck my family to get them out, and uh, I set up a little micro hospital in my basement. Um, and by the time, you know, the core, the first day, two day people evacuated, there was the, you know, big core that stayed. I was responsible for about three, four hundred people. And um, why do you think they stayed? Uh, obviously, there's a part of ignorance. There's a part of not knowing, not, you know, this isn't going to happen. Um, and then especially the older generation people, um, even after I evacuated out butcher, there was old people that just stayed there. Not pro-Russian, just where else are they going to go? This is my home. Take my chances. They're old, so I can't see through their eyes. I don't know exactly what yeah. their, their thought process was, but um, yeah, it was, uh, uh, yeah. So anyway, we, I, I, I treated about 20 people that were injured from different types of shelling and stuff, uh, performed some minor surgeries. Um, cracked open a few pharmacies um, and just took all the supplies out, moved them to the basements, began uh, sort of a system for issuing out medicine, especially to the older people with chronic illnesses. So they would write lists by their buildings. One one person in charge would write a list, come to us, and me and a few other volunteers would dish out the medicine. I was the, the main like, trauma medic. Um, we had some, some people badly injured from just some random shelling around us. Uh, and yeah, we just it sort of, it's funny how life, revert so quickly back to this 
So within the fir within this third or the fourth day, no phone signal, gas was gone. They precision striked like the gas and water. So no water, no gas, no power, no internet. And, you know, people just, just revert back to that primal stage, I guess. You know, people were building stoves outside the front of the basements and, you know, finding wood, plywood and chopping it up and cooking outside, making soups. The women would go to cooking. The men would be out, you know, foraging as such and, and, and providing, I don't know, uh, building things and stuff like that. So um, obviously you've got, we're in a new world now, you know, people that like talk about, you know, extreme feminism and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, it's the classic sexist comment, you know, women belong in the kitchen, but, you know, people do revert back to that almost hunter-gatherer stage when they're faced with a life or death situation. and. Butcher, as, as the world knows what Butcher is now, it was it was pretty hardcore, you know, there was, it was uh, mental. Um, Are the stories about Butcher true? The, to your opinion and knowledge there, the, the stories of many people just killed blatantly in the street and executed and rape and... Yeah, so I think the initial information that we saw, um, the... The executions um, and stuff like that, people being like summarily executed and stuff like that. Obviously, there is a bigger picture to it. It, it, it. Obviously, with the Ukrainians released it afterwards, a lot of those guys were territorial defense members. So they were uh, basically civilian fighters, people that were equipped with weapons to defend their homes and everything. Um, again, doesn't justify summarily executing anyone. No. Um, they should be treated as prisoners of wars. But if they were non-uniform combatants, obviously it drifts off into a different part of the Geneva Convention. Um, there is definitely uh, incidents of things like rape, murder, stuff like that. Um, and we predominantly saw that from the, the, the soldiers from the Eastern Russia, the Bristanians, the, 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 the more Eastern Russian troops. Um, and all that's been, it's not something for me to comment on, it's all been investigated yes. and it's all been openly released. So um, I, it's not like I was running around Butcher exploring and you know, documenting things. So I was sort of locked into, my world was my uh, large apartment complex of about 25 buildings. So that was my world. Um, I only left it once during the uh, during the first two and a half weeks of the invasion. That was to, to go forage for supplies because we were out. Um, that in, in itself was a very daunting thing. So we, we I gathered some men that weren't really doing much and we were going to go check the, the epicenter, the local uh, like big convenience store and also some gas stations. And I remember when we, we first left, it was, it was quite quiet. The Russians had already captured Butcher at this point. And there was a Russian... Uh, I think the BRDMs, the, the, the airborne BMPs was, you know, like uh, 800 metres down the road and it was sort of covering the road and we ran out in twos across the road and it just sort of lazily fired a few shots down the road, just sort of scare us. And, but the, the, the weirdest thing was that as we come out, the roads were just churned up and covered in tank tracks. It was like, like a whole army had been through there, which, which they had been. But to see that, like to see the gas station that we always used to go to, like shot up and looted and there's like tank tracks and track marks all over the ground and craters and stuff in a place that, you know, your home effectively. Easy to compartmentalise all the other places you go to. If you're a US Marine or a British soldier in Afghanistan and you're clearing compounds and, you know, kicking doors in in Fallujah, you can decompartmentalise from that because it's not your home. Yes. It's not even similar to your home. Obviously, when it happens at your home, and I think that's why a lot of other people resonated with it, because Butcher looks like the average Western town or city. So, yeah, obviously, just like, fuck, like, this is real. Because it's easy to, you know, obviously sleeping in the basement at night, and then when you're out in the day, you're in the, you've got all these apartments around you, you're not seeing the bigger picture. And when I went out for that first time, um, yeah, went on a little spy run, uh, half of us went to the, tried to go to the epicenter up the road, half of us went to the gas station, just grabbed some drinks, you know, whatever we could find. The Russians are taking all the good stuff, like cigarettes and that. Um, I think the other team got about halfway up there and then the Russians were shooting rounds to disperse looters and stuff. Um, and then they came back. Uh, that, that was a scary thing. I think that's why I'm not a prepper or a, a apocalypto sort of person, but... Um, it literally took two or three days in Butcher, like before everything went to went to complete shit. No yeah. police, nothing. People were cracking open shops. Uh, as a picture, I, I took on my Instagram of when we went to get stuff from the local shop near me, and there's just some volunteers throwing stuff off like the the stairs, and then just a crowd of people with their arms outstretched. That's like day two of the war. Yeah, it shows how unprepared people are now for things like that. And in Ukraine, people are more prepared here than they are in the West. Absolutely, people keep basements full of preserved food and and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it. It happened so quickly for stuff to, once the power, gas, water's out, and people, you know, the shops close, 
you're back in the caves, man. You know, mm. back to the the primal hunter gatherer stage, um, and it's in everyone. There was some people that just just wanted to sit in the basement all day and do nothing. Just wanted it to be over, and that's understandable. That's fear, it's like fight or flight. But you know, a lot of people did pitch in, and it was a good community aspect. So. Um, yeah, it carried on like that, really, just all days blurred into one. I think I was there for about 16, 17 days. And then we started to hear rumours and some news reports that we got from, you know, basic phone signal that a green corridor was being opened to Kiev. Initially, it was only women and children allowed, what we were told. So we made a separate plan, the men, that we would try and get through the woods and get round them and, you know, try and make it back to Stoyanka or to, like, Erpin after Erpin. Um, would have been suicide, I'm glad we didn't. But, uh, yeah, then we found information that men could leave as well. We, uh, I think the first day, a few people made it through, uh, and then the Russians closed the corridor, and then a bunch of people came back to the apartment. And then the second day, we tried again, uh, loaded up into three vehicles. Um, everyone, a lot of people just sort of, you know, get every man for himself, get the hell out of Dodge. But from my basement, a few of us stayed together in three vehicles, put loads of white tape on everything, you know. Um, I I wasn't fighting in Butcher, you know, I was, I, I stayed in my lane working as a medic. Mm. Um, I would have still been a combatant if I got captured or something, but stayed in my lane working as a medic and I left as a non-combatant as well. Didn't leave armoured or weapons or uniform or anything. I left with my family to get my family out. So uh, we loaded up into three vehicles, white tape and everything, uh, piled in all the cats into a bunch of improvised boxes, seven cats, a couple of dogs. Uh, we picked up another dog during the Butcher escapade as well because... Uh, the Chechens were operating in smaller groups, just looting and, you know, destroying everything. And one night they came well ahead of the Russians and went into old butcher across the field from me. Um, apparently they took a bunch of hostages. I didn't see it, just from what I heard. Yeah. They took a bunch of hostages, killed a bunch of people, destroyed a bunch of stuff, which they did, um, and then left again. Uh, in the night we heard it all going on. And then in the morning this dog came over with a badly injured paw. Um, me and my missus fixed it up and, uh, now that Germany, now that dog's in Germany with my family, um, <laughs> called Couscous. Cous. Uh, fi fixed the dog up, saved it, got it out. Anyway, yeah, loaded up all the animals, dogs and everything, uh, into the cars, and then, uh, yeah, drove drove through. We we decided to avoid the Erpin Bridge because it was just chaos. You could only go through one across at a time. It wouldn't have been possible with all our animals. So we went the other route, which was around Stoyanka, through Stoyanka, which we controlled at the time, uh, and first Russians we saw was about five minutes after leaving us. They had just a BMP parked on the road, little block post. They just waved us through, um, carried on going. Uh, and we got to uh, sort of a corner where you turn up uh, before you lot turn off to a pin. And uh, there was like Russian, uh, like Vodover, like Airborne. Yeah. Probably more like the Spetsnaz, like Special Forces type of guys. They were in quite good equipment and everything. Uh, they stopped us um, again. You know, I've seen the Russians, I've seen the Russians do a lot of bad things and they have done a lot of bad things. But from my experience in Butcher leaving, they were very professional. They were obviously professional soldiers, you know, contract soldiers. Um, they kept their weapons low. Um, but obviously in regards to that as well, as we were driving up this road, we saw civilian vehicles all over the road, some with bodies still in them. Some of them were children marked on the side. But one thing that was similar of all of them, they all had 30 millimeter uh, uh, holes in them. And I think a lot of that, a lot of it, not all of it, was fog of war. So pretty much all the vehicles that were destroyed, the civilian vehicles, were 30 mil, which is from the Russian Airborne, who were the ones on the west side of Kiev attacking. That's from their cannons, from their BRDMs or BDRM. Yeah. Someone, some that tank will... nerd can correct me. Yeah, exactly. AFE recognition or someone get on that. Um, but obviously, you're in a foreign country. You know, you're invading. You're looking for a tank scope this big and seeing the world through that. If you see a car, something moving, driving towards you. Yeah. You could be you could panic you know you're if you're untrained or you're you're scared so that was one thing um i did see that but yeah vehicles marked up with children civilian vehicles shot up to hell um but when we got to this checkpoint they didn't raise their weapons we all stood in the car with our hands like this they told us to put our hands down i think it was the commander opened my door and i said to him in russian i said i've got you know look at all these cats these dogs can you please close the door he said yep no problem closed it check the trunks of the car quickly um and that was it pretty much. And how were they very polite? Were they... I didn't talk, it's not that like we had like conversations, yeah. but just from what I, just the way they spoke, you could tell they were more preoccupied on the military situation. Yes. They knew there was a green corridor. They weren't there to just, oh, Ukrainians, let's just kill them all. Yeah. They just wanted, you know, they just, it's better for them, obviously. If you're a professional soldier, it's better for you if there's less civilians in an area. So every civilian that leaves is more buildings that you can just blow up and more, yes. you know, more kinetic action you can do without worrying about killing civilians. 
So yeah, they they waved us through. The they didn't check documents. Luckily, um, I left all my military documents at home, but I had my British passport and sort of hidden the phone and had my my old phone. Let us through. We went for a few other Russians that just waved us through. Um, and then uh, yeah, we, and these are like Russian airborne troops. They were in the newest Russian kit, AK-12s. I think they they look quite professional. And then we get to Stoyanka, the first Ukrainian block post, and it's held by these like proper territorial defence guys, and, like civilians or mixed camouflage, shotguns, AR-15s, and their morale was high. You know, and we get there, and it's you know I, I almost cried. I know everyone else did in the car. Um, I think I probably did cry as well. To be fair, it's like you know back on Ukrainian territory, and I sort of said to him, I said, lads, like you know, I said. There's some there's some boys down there, you know. They're 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 well equipped. They look good. They look fresh. Um, and they were just like, yeah, don't worry about it. We have got guys everywhere. And obviously, there was a lot of Ukrainians out in yeah. the trees holding the line. Uh, waited on an evacuation queue and then uh, back into Kiev. Um, uh, after that, I joined a, a special purpose unit in Kiev. Um, did some operations. Uh, I did one operation with them in the Sumy region. Um, done some training with them. Helped them train. They were obviously trained themselves. They were obviously. Uh, this unit itself were really experienced guys. Um, worked with them for a while, and then I, I started working into the training stuff. My time in the military had finished, so I decided that I could be a good bridge between the Ukrainians and the, the Westerners coming here to help. Yeah. Um, I know the Western militaries, I know the Western world, and I know Ukrainian military and Ukrainian world. I'm the only foreigner that isn't in captivity that was serving in the military before the war started, so I had a You're good the insight. One. The only one. There was a couple others, but they had, had left the military earlier um, for whatever reasons. Um, I'm the only one that, that did the whole service and uh, served with them. It's obviously Sean and Aidan as well, but unfortunately they're in captivity. So mm. uh, then I yeah established training. So we, we just started training units. Um, I started a training organization called Trident Defense Initiative, um, and we've been training Ukrainian soldiers and equipping them for free uh, for the last six months now. Do you think you'll go back to fight? Uh, I don't think so. Um, this is my my not necessarily issue, but you know my thing with the, like things like the Foreign Legion. Um, okay, you're a great soldier. You're you know you've spent ten years or whatever in the British or the American military. You've got you know great skills to offer, great everything. I think it's incredibly wasteful to just you know pick up a rifle and go fire on the line. I think there's much more credence and much more uh, uh, need for training. And you could offer those skills to a thousand Ukrainian soldiers instead of picking up a rifle and, and getting on the line. But, you know, each to their own. Mm. Um, I've done my time on the front line here, spent, you know, even in the this this the part of the full scale war I was fighting. And I spent two years in the trenches before this. So yeah. um, I've got nothing to prove. And, you know, I've, uh, I've done enough. So I think the training's more valuable. And up to this time, we've trained over 2000 Ukrainian soldiers now and equipped them for the most part. Um, and we're looking at you know training upwards of ten thousand more at the moment. So to me, that's more valuable, and right. I think in the long run, that's that's what's needed. So and as a Western soldier, as an experienced soldier, uh, what's it like going up against the Russians? At least uh, the ones you've gone up. Were they professional? Were they competent? What I personally saw as uh, when Just I was a, when I was a non-combatant, yeah. obviously what I saw from believing Butcher, obviously they were the best of the best Russians, the Verda Ver division. Um, they, you know they looked very professional, well equipped. Some of them looked very young and scared, but you know for the most part they they did look like what we thought the Russians were before a near peer army. Um, I'm not a tactical commentator or you know something like that, but you know from what we've seen, the the military definitely isn't up to what we believed it was near peer. Um, still incredibly large. Um, with an incredible armory, uh, an a, a unlimited armory, a limitless armory. You know, they have enough ammunition and weapons to continue this war forever. Obviously, what ends wars earlier is public opinion. Um, and, you know, I think the public opinion in Russia will definitely will change soon. Um, if the sanctions stay up and everything like that. Uh, and also, you know, uh, yeah, you know, it's probably people watching this that are pro-Russian, um, you know, Western people that are pro-Russian, they'd be pro-Ukrainians, but there isn't really a need for this war. Yeah, you know, there isn't really a need for this war. There's not really, you know, you could say there's no need for any war. There's, there is need for some wars, but there isn't really need for it, for this war, you mm. know, especially after you're on the back foot, your, your three-day operation failed. Um, better if they took the loss at the beginning, a minor loss, and took their small victories, like something like Mariupol, if mm. you want to call that a victory, you know, just wiping a city off the face of the earth but um i was always a big big supporter and big advocate of hey stop making the military smaller stop relying on technology 
You need a big army. You need thousands of tanks. All right, we're yeah. going to go up against the Russians one day. You need lots of men and lots of tanks. You don't. I was wrong. All you need is technology. Technology is winning this war. You know, biactars, things like javelins, end laws. Mm. It's great having a thousand tanks that the turret pops off if you throw a piece of wet tissue at it. If you've got yeah. 10,000 of them, that's great if you're going to storm Berlin and wipe your way across Europe. If you're just trying to do coordinated assaults and topple yeah. one sovereign state, you're just going to get chewed apart by technology um, and, you know, the, the days of the Soviet military defeating the Germans. didn't work for the Germans in World War II. Technology was their failure, unfortunately. They couldn't build enough of it. The Russians could. The Russians didn't evolve from that tactic, whereas, you know, having good technology, having, you know, brimstone missiles and you know, uh, anti-radar missiles and end laws and stuff like that. That's what the winner is. Technology is the winner now. There'd be an argument to say, and I should probably lean on this, that we haven't seen a lot of the high-end Russian technology yet. Now, I also don't have an opinion on whether that exists or is serviceable or yep. not. So I guess that's the rebuttal to my argument. But is there a bit of you that may think, like, they are purposely not deploying yet because especially like their air force like mm. the russian air force is very vast very get yep. out now the serviceability of the equipment no one i can't comment on but is there that idea that they've deployed the special operation and you're using what they're willing to lose not exactly the cream cream of the crop Definitely not. I think that's what the Russian propagandists would like people yeah. to believe. You know, we've got all this great stuff, but I think Russia are very similar to China in that aspect. You know, the Americans build the F-35, China build a copy of it and, yeah. you know, show some videos of it running and doing stuff. But in reality, it's 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 total dog shit. Yeah. Probably most likely with the new, you know, because of the vast corruption, which exists here as well, and it exists yeah. back in the States, it exists back in the UK, but, you know, uh, Eastern Europe is more prevalent to corruption. I think that the Russians uh, and, you know, states like the Chinese state as well. Um, but, yeah, definitely the Russians. I, I think most of that stuff's bullshit, you know, what yeah. they show at Army Expo. It's been just their recent Army Expo they did. Half the stuff there was yeah. proved to be the fake. The dog was off Wish.com. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a Wish.com dog. So I think recently as well, just, just a couple of days ago, there was a lot of tanks that the Ukrainians captured or destroyed that were actually parade tanks. They had something like 20 kilometers on their motors. They were, they were used for parades. Right. So they really are scraping the barrel. Um, they don't have enough of the new T-90s because if you're a Russian, you know, uh, requisition guy or something and you go, hey, we got this new tank, it's awesome. Okay, it's gonna, you know, it's got active defense system, it's a T-90 or it's the breakthrough. It's really good, but it costs this amount of money. Mm. Someone's gonna go, I've got, you know, 50,000 T-60s sat in storage. They'll be good enough. If I have 60,000 T-70s and pay, you know, $50 billion to make, you know, 100 of these new tanks, and that's the Russian mindset. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of that Soviet grandeur as well. These tanks are amazing. You know, they're, they're still running. They're still fine. They do work. We use them in Ukraine as well against them. Um, and they do work. The Russians use them against us and killing us with them as well. Mm. So, yeah, the, the Air Force is one as well. They don't want to lose their you know, best jets. I'd rather keep them for the parades and stuff to make people feel powerful. Yeah. They're not, there isn't, apart from saying nuclear weapons, which in my opinion will hopefully never be deployed. Um, I, I have a feeling of, even if, I'm not worried about it because I'm like, well, if it is, we're all done. If it right. is, there's nothing you can do about nothing it. It's the same with airstrikes. I learned that in Syria. Like, I'm more scared, be scared of artillery because mm. you've got a bit of time to hear it coming in and you can, you know, you've got time to shit your pants. With an airstrike, you don't really have time to shit your pants. <laughs> you know, the shit will explode from your body the same time your blood will. So there's not, not no need to be scared of something that you can't necessarily control. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, yeah, in regards to technology, I think is look at like, things like the AK-12. It's a, they're more propaganda statements, actual effective things. It looks cool, this new AK-12. The Russians hate them. The best thing about it is the magazine. You know, Russians have stopped using them. That's why you don't see many of them anymore. Because Russian soldiers are going back to using the AK-74 because it's better, because it works. So it's the same with these tanks. They look great on paper, they're great, but the products aren't finished. There's not enough of them built. Yeah. And the ones that are built and being pushed out here are not finished, so they're dog shit. So yeah. better to use that T-72 that runs like a workhorse and can put, you know, 20 rounds down a minute. Again, guys, correct me, because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I don't really, yeah, I don't really uh, pay attention to tank numbers and serial numbers and no. what makes one different um both shoot things at you and are scary so yeah whatever um but yeah yeah i don't think they're 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 up to that scratch that they are yeah. i'd be the same probably they've got they built enough stuff for world war three and world war four and world war five in the soviet union yeah 
it's still working. You know, I, I always have a thing I say to people, I used to say in Syria, we were cracking open these ammo cans that were packed in like 1972. Mm. And I used to say, what happens when this ammo runs out? I've never seen any AK rounds that were made after the Soviet Union, or not many that were made after the Soviet Union. Yeah. So what happens in one day, whether it be in 100 or 200 years, what happens when all this Soviet ammo runs out? There's nobody making any more. Leon on China. Yeah, there you Leon go, Leon on China. Or we'll just start fighting by hands again. Yeah. Go back to the sticks and spears, bows and arrows. Hmm. But with the amount of equipment they've got, if they went to a war style, although they might suffer massive losses, mm. Do you think they could count if they wanted to counter the massive uh, offensives that Ukraine has on at the moment? Could they just by sheer numbers? Because I think it's been very obvious, at least in my eyes, that Russia hasn't cared about losing men. And I figure, do we even have enough javelins on the front to counter if they just deploy 10? We have enough larders to buy every family a larder. I like larders. I love larders. They look great. The old ones, they're getting the new ones for their dead sons. But, uh, um, you know, again, can't talk for the Russian state. Yeah. Don't know if they care about their men or not. Right. Maybe they don't. Um, doesn't look like they do. But uh, it's great having 50,000 tanks. Yeah. Can you crew every single one of them? Public That's opinion good. goes and everyone's sons are getting killed in human wave attacks that Putin's putting out. Yeah. You're not going to be able to crew the tanks. You can't. Yeah. Uh, you can line up all the tanks, but you can't put people in them. So your war being here, what you're doing, yep. where do you see this leading in the next six months? Not the war itself, but just individually for yourself and your guys and the training you're doing uh obviously the training will get more intense during the winter months as the fighting dies down um it will turn into this sort of stuff again in some places i think there'll there'll be small marked offensives on the ukrainian side taking back ground the russians over expanded at the beginning they're not gonna be able to hold on to all that ground they kept there'll be places that they will be able to hold on to for potentially indefinitely like they did in 2014 or potentially for a long time um but ukrainians now have the ability to take that ground back since 2014, we haven't had the ability. If we tried to take it back, we would have got, uh, would have had a bad time. And what's given them that ability? Things like the Western weapons obviously yeah. have helped, the high Mars stuff like that. Um, uh, Bayaktars, you know, it's very, very hard to shoot a Bayaktar down if it's done the right way. Uh, high Mars is pretty much impossible to intercept from what I've heard. Um, so, you know, you now have the ability to strike things out of the traditional range. Um, if we were to go Soviet equipment, the Soviet equipment with the Russians, they have updated versions of the Soviet equipment. We have the older versions of the Soviet equipment. They have more men. We would lose that war. The yeah. Western weapons have obviously changed this. Um, uh, but again, people like to say, oh, our Western weapons saved you guys, you owe us. Western weapons are useless if they're not in the hands of people that are willing to defend their country. Absolutely useless. You can give, uh, look at Afghanistan. Yes. We gave Afghanistan trillions of dollars of equipment. They were not willing to defend their country. Okay, they were able to, but they were not willing. The Ukrainians might not be able to, but they're willing. And now with the Western weapons, we've made them able. And I hope at some very small scale, because, you know, my organization is the largest trained organization in Ukraine at the moment. But, you know, I'm not, I, I doubt I'm making much of a battlefield impact, a small impact, but, you know, training as well, making them able to fight. Some people aren't able to fight. They were civilians six months ago, but giving them, they have the will to do it. So give them the equipment so they are able to do it. Yeah. No, thanks. No, I appreciate that, mate. No, no good, mate. Well, look, mate, thanks for talking to me. Appreciate it. Anytime, baby. It's a more, more serious talk. Yeah, no. You you, have. Well, I think you have a serious talk as well, don't you? 90% of the talk, time it's you and me talking shit. Messing around. Well, that, well that's how we're soldiers, aren't we? You know? Yeah. Whether you were 10 years ago, one year ago. Um, and I think in the, I think it's from Lord of the Rings, isn't it? In our darkest times, you've got to find light. So, you know, let's have a laugh. Uh, I'll be dead tomorrow. It, mate. Thank you for your time. Cheers, buddy. Easy. Cheers, bro.